So hello. Well, it's very loud. So hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Mandy Zhong, and I'm from the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, University of College London. Um, I'm really excited to be here to listen to all these amazing ideas and also discuss the research topic that I'm passionate about. But before I discuss the topic, I'd like to see a little bit more about where I work. So the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, we also call it CASA, and it's a research center set up by Mike Batty 20 years ago at University College London, and he's still working there. So we have a very diverse um, profile. We have people study geography, and they're urban planners, and architects, artists, mathematicians, physicists, and computer scientists. We work on a, a very wide range of research projects, including very standard urban modeling, data visualization, complexity theory, and also public health and Internet of Things. We have a really cute um, page. Please check it out if you like. And we have a specifically chatty Twitter account. So have a look. So I, uh, I am trained as a computer scientist in machine learning, and I work in the sector of public health. The project I work on is called ISENS. We're trying to detect infectious disease outbreaks ever, uh, earlier than ever, and we want to grant patients sufficient access to health facilities and advice, and their advice. And we want, the ultimate goal for us is to protect the population. So we work with a, a very interdisciplinary team. We have material engineer working on nanotechnology-based rapid test. We also have computer vision people working on machine learning of medical images. And my role in this project is just to put all the data sets they have together and trying to visualize in an informative way for our user group. We have a quite different user group in this case. We're talking to policymakers, Department of Health, and clinicians, and the general public. So, um, as I mentioned, I work with uh, quite a just to mention, I also work with uh, very uh, experts from different disciplines, and they're on the acknowledgement side. We also have a very chatty Twitter account. If you like, please have a look. So uh, start with the why it matters question. So why we want to do infectious disease surveillance? It is because a healthy population means strong economy and a stable society. We are in an age that is facing lots of new health challenges that does not happen before. We worry about super drugs. We think of drug-resistant mutations all the time. And these challenges are even more difficult for areas that have less resource. So just as stated in the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. As we embark on the great collective journey, we pledge that no one will be left behind. And that's exactly what we think about. No one should be left behind when facing these health challenges. And we want to develop this earning sensory system to help us. The key questions we ask um, during the research can be divided into two parts. So we care about the infectious disease. That's all about bacteria and virus. So there are a very heavy part on the genome sequence analysis. We think of what string is it? Where did the string come from? And is there anything suspicious changing? We also care a lot on the spatial elements here because we want to know which areas get infected more, which areas are under high risk, 
And is there any targeted intervention we can apply to these regions? We want to develop this GPS system by combining genome sequencing and time and place together. This would help us to answer a lot of questions, including monitor outbreaks of infectious disease and identify risk groups. We can also design and implement personalized treatment based on the drug-resistant mutations. We can also look into the research of human in the loop framework. As I mentioned, we're facing very different user groups and to communicate this information to them in a better way is all we're interested. So I'd like to just give some examples of uh, how genome sequencing can be, can be interesting. So one of the very interesting information we get from genome sequencing is we can form the transmission chains. It is exactly like the telephone game. That is to say, you have a chain of people, and they want to pass, whisper the secret word to the other one, and then this word gets passed on to the end. When the word gets transferred, it might, get, it might change a little bit from one another. It's exactly the same thing when we see bacteria and virus. Certain positions on the genome will change a little bit through the transition. And we can use this information to form a hierarchy of genomes. Um, here is an example we had uh, with uh, University College London Hospital about flu genome. And using this hierarchy, we can have really useful information on when and where this patient get infected. We can even have an estimation of who passed this, this virus to him. So we are interested in a lot of use cases in this, in this case. Um, by combining genome information and the spatial analysis, I would like to introduce two of the ongoing ones. The first one is mapping flu in Brazil. So we did this collaboration uh, with, and we have sampling, uh, samples from eight administrative regions. Um, Brazil has really rich epidemic data, which is very helpful and they have very high vaccination rates for, for flu. Uh, they are all above 80% for their small children and elderly people, which has an easy praise for flu. Uh, comparing to UK, we only have 43% for the little ones and 73 for the elderly people. However, the flu trends in Brazil display very unusual behavior. So dividing it by southern and northern region, we can see this in flu, uh, the flu trends in the south are more seasonal. So they have the peaks in our summer, it's actually in their winter. Well, for looking at the trends in the northern area, it looks like the peak shifts a little bit forward, but we don't know why. And we're working on that. Um, did, we have a couple of suspicions. So it might be a strain get, transmi uh, get transmitted within each region, or the strain get passed from north to south and south to north on a yearly basis. We also want to know whether the surrounding areas or surrounding countries have the disease, uh, pass the disease strain inside the Brazil. And understanding those questions would help us to design a more targeted, targeted vaccine time frame. So apparently, they give vaccine in April, which is perfect for the southern regions because it's at the start of their flu season. However, it will not be very helpful for the northern people because it's already ended. We're also interested in looking at 
is climate the major driver of this pattern? Um, it is not only about temperature. It's a mixture of things. Because simply if we look at temperature, in the northern cities, it's always very warm all year round. However, the cases of flu peaked at the late autumn season. In the southern cities, the variance of temperature is larger, but the variance of cases is not that big. So this is one case. So another, another user uh, use case we're doing is mapping connectivities in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is very important because access to health facilities and advice is directly linked to the health indicator, the population health in a low resourceful region. And we specifically care about three types of data. The first layer is about health indicators. It could be, um, it could be like HIV positive rate or their life expectancy expectation. We also care about the population data here. We want to know the population density. We want to know the demographic. And on top of these two layers, we want to plot the connectivity data. And we want to know where, to, where the health facility are. And we want to know where shall we put a new ones. We also care about the mobile signal coverage, as we have been developing lots of mobile-based applications that have give um, patient better suggestions and advice. Um, we also care about the transportation here, and that's a classical GIS problem. So this map displayed a population distribution in Uganda, and we can see it's more biased towards the, the south side. When we put the cell tower locations on top, um, we can see large area is not really covered or close to the cell towers. And we finally put the health facilities with a range of five kilometers as a single, as a small dot on this map. We identified the area that are under high risk because we can see in the northern region, there are places with high population density, such as carbon, and they do not have even, uh, it do not have mobile uh, coverage, and they do not have much health facilities. Similar part ha happens to the southern city, Kosovo. And this, having this map will help us to develop interventions to help the local regional connectivities to health resources. We have been thinking of developing this mobile vans with clinical facility to each tribe and region. So um, as these two cases are just a work in progress, I would like to talk a little bit about challenges more. So obviously, because we're working with health data, it is there, it is confidential and has restricted availability. We have a lot of delicate ethical discussion related to that. About connectivity data, because we need to, this, we need to use this map to give real-time real -time, um, results that we can act on. So we need the data to be reliable and they're better to be complete. Another challenge is lies on um, how to communicate res the result to the stakeholders and to the people who care about that. Because we're working with people who have very different visualization literacy. Uh, we're talking about the field workers taking blood samples in these mobile clinical vans every day. And we, we want to, to inform policymakers to make them interested in this problem. So this is also a very a uh, very big challenge. So although the challenge exists, we're very passionate about this research. 
and we welcome and appreciate all sorts of uh, contribution or collaboration in this field. So, thank you.